Well, we want to continue on in our study of the book of John. We had a, about three verses left in chapter uh, 13 uh, last week. And we'll mention those before we move on into what we have as chapter 14. You'll remember that in this section, last three verses, 36 through 38, that this is a record that John has of Peter's denials, that is denying of the Christ. This begins by Peter saying, uh, you know, where are you going, Lord? And Jesus answered, where I go, you can't follow now, but you'll follow later. Well, Peter responds, literally, it's it, it's saying, well, why, why can't I follow you right now? That's the force of Peter's question. He said, I'll lay down my life for you. Well, then Jesus responds by saying, the cop shall not crow until you deny me thrice or three times. Now, if you want to see the full record of that, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record it. Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and Luke 22, I believe those chapters have um, those inspired writers' record of, of Peter and the situations that were involved. But that's the way that chapter concludes. Now, in summation, as far as what that chapter had to say, before we move on into chapter 14, uh, we see that uh, starting out in that chapter that Jesus states that he is the teacher and he is the Lord. And then he claims that the betrayal is foretold actually in the scriptures. And he claims that those who receive him, that is Jesus, also receive the Father. And he specifically identifies the one who would betray him, which we studied last week. And then, of course, is Judas Iscariot. Here he calls himself the Son of Man. I might make a little more remark about that. Son of Man identifies, uh, lets him identify with you and me as human beings. And he refers to himself that way many times. He claimed that God would glorify the Son immediately. And he states plainly in that chapter that he was going away. And then, as we just noted, it was foretold that Simon Peter would deny him three times. And that's how we sum up that particular chapter. Now, let me remind you that beginning in that chapter that Jesus is now speaking to his apostles in particular. And that's important, especially now in view of what he's going to say. As a part of handling a right, handling correctly, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15, as we study it, we must take into account, again, who's speaking, to whom is that person speaking, and what is the subject under consideration? Keep those points in mind, especially as we go into chapter 14. He talks to his apostles and he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, Brett's uh, lesson tonight helps us maybe on this. When he says, Jesus did to the apostles, let not your heart be troubled. Well, now we have a little better understanding of what Jesus was saying. But it also lets us know that I have responsibility and I have control, as was indicated, over my inward man. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. John would say elsewhere that perfect love casteth out fear. But remember the proof, the true proof of our love for God, and he'll talk about that later, is seen in our obedience to the Father's will. Well, that would mean then that rather than fear, which causes us to not obey God and not stay faithful, 
has been alleviated by our will to submit to his will, which is backed up by the love that we have for godly things and God, of course, himself. So I have a responsibility not to let my heart be troubled. But notice it's based upon believe in God, believe also in me. Now, they had no problem with believing in God. And he's saying, if you believe in God, who he has called all the time through his earthly ministry, his father, and referred to him as his God, then he says, the thing you need to do is believe in me. This belief is built upon adequate evidence and credible witnesses. Even as John writes this, he's giving us the material so that we can believe. So this was originally written to people of that time to cause them to be able to have the kind of belief that would save their soul, belief in Christ. But when it was transpiring, that is when Jesus was actually doing these things and saying these things, then he's telling them, John just records what he said, that this is done for your benefit. So you believe in God, believe also in me. Did they have the adequate evidence to believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of God? Certainly they did. We've been spending time earlier on this matter uh, in the other parts of this study. So then he says, in my father's house are many mansions, actually many dwelling places. We use the word mansion today to think of a great, large, expensive edifice. But it means literally uh, there's room enough for all in the house of God. Now, we know from 1 Timothy 3.15 that the house of God is the church of the living God. So when he talks about this, you know, there's room for everybody in the Lord's church if they will comply with the Lord's terms of pardon by believing and submitting to them in order to be in the church. When you obey the gospel, the Lord adds you to the church. Paul says in Coloss uh, Galatians 3 and 27, you're baptized into Christ. Are there requisites before baptism? Certainly. And he's talking about it right here. The first one is being brought to belief, not just in Christ, but first to believe in God. Then believe in Christ. That's what the situation was here. Now, that may not all happen in just step one, step two, step three, because as one studying, these things can happen rather rapidly when understanding takes place in the heart. And by the way, that's where understanding takes place, as Brett well pointed out, in our intellectual part, where we take in the information and we process it. We reason, as Isaiah said on behalf of God, come, let us reason together. And so when the gospel is preached, it's preached to people who, if it's going to do them any good, would reason with what they have and conclude that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. When we seek to prove the existence of God, then proving indicates we're offering evidence and we're reasoning with it. And the best, best evidence is that God exists. When it comes to Jesus Christ being the Son of God, then it's the same thing. When it comes to the Bible being the very word of God, the plenary, verbal, inspired word of God, we do the same thing. Um, I think some people have the idea that talking about the emotional area of the heart, that conversion is a convulsion. Well, it's not. Conversion is a reasonable intellectual thing. Now, when you look at the Ethiopian eunuch, he was studying. He didn't understand what he was reading, but somebody who knew more than he did taught him. And he acknowledged that was the thing. How can I, except some man should guide me? So Philip began at the same scripture, which is Isaiah 53, and preached unto him Jesus. Well, having been persuaded that Christ is the Son of God and the Savior, the Messiah, and he certainly knew the Messiah for he'd been up to Jerusalem to worship under the law of Moses. 
Then he said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me being baptized? He said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Notice, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. That means the belief, the confidence, the trust that saves one permeates the whole of what Brett, talk, Brett talked about a while ago of the heart. Every chamber is brought, as he used it, every chamber is brought to confidence or belief or faith that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Then he acted upon that, was baptized. After that, you see the display of his emotions, not that he was doing cartwheels on across the desert. That's not the point. But he rejoiced. Why? I know my sins are forgiven. I'm fully reconciled to God. I'm a child of God. I'm a member of the body of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I have the peace that passes all understanding. So he went on his way rejoicing. This is what the Lord is doing here with his apostles. They don't even know at this time what a tremendous weighty obligation is going to fall on their shoulders. And though they've been with him over three years at this time, they still don't have the wherewithal to be able to withstand what's coming upon them. Oh, they had heard him say, if they hated me, they will hate you. But they did not see all of that. And they would begin to see it. And you can see how ill-prepared they were because they all forsook him when he was arrested. And of course, Peter, so bold in his affirmation to stand with the Lord, denied him three times. So we can think we're ready to go, but when the whole heart's not involved in it, we pretty well find out when the going gets rough. So when we look at this, he said, in my father's house or many dwelling places, many mansions, there's room for all. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I don't know all that that entails. Can anybody now tell me exactly what Christ is doing right now? Can they tell me exactly the details of what the angels are doing right now, what the Father's doing right now, what the Holy Spirit's doing now? No. But we have the general understanding from the scriptures that they're all working on our behalf. Think about the statement Paul made to Timothy that Christ is the only mediator between God and man. Man, Christ, is the only mediator. Think about how the writer of Hebrews says he ever liveth to make intercession for us. What all does that mean? Well, it means at least one thing. He's on our side. He wants us to be in heaven. And when we love him with the whole heart and believe him and believe his gospel and obey him, and we're baptized into Christ for the rest of sins, and we walk the straight and narrow way, we're willing to even die rather than transgress his will then I know that all of heaven's on my side. And that's true of every faithful child of God. Notice, child of God. Your elder brother is King Jesus. All of these words should be great and they should be comforting in the very depths of our heart as we understand what they mean. So he says, that's the reason I'm going. And he says, if I do this, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Again, did they understand the depths of the meanings of all of this? No, I'm sure they didn't. But if they would just stay, as we might say, if they just stay with him, if they would stay faithful one day at a time as they grew and developed, it would all work out just fine. And that's one reason it's interesting to see later on that Jesus would tell them to tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. They would need what he's about to tell them about in these next few chapters what the Holy Spirit is going to supply to them to do the work of the ambassadors of the court of heaven, the apostles of Jesus Christ, which they did while inspiration of the Holy Spirit was in man. But now they still do it 
in the written word. As we read even John now, writing what he wrote almost 2,000 years ago as an apostle of Christ. You say, well, what would John teach us today about these things if he were here in person? I don't need to ask that question. I have the book of John. I know what he would teach us. And that would be true of every inspired writer of the New Testament. So he says, and you know the way where I'm going. I doubt they understood the depth of that. But uh, they knew enough to keep them together. There's a lot of times that we know things and we'd like to know a whole lot more. And given time and study and patience, we will learn a lot more. Sometimes we try to run ahead. <laughs> we used to say kids growing up to get too big for their britches. Sometimes Christians can get too big for their britches. They try to jump ahead rather than one day at a time, studying as they ought to, praying as they ought to, living as they ought to, making the necessary corrections. They don't realize that they're developing and growing so that sometimes what they wondered about a year ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was, there becomes a, in their lives one of those aha moments. I see that now. Well, that didn't accidentally happen. That happened because of building of knowledge. And therefore, it's consistency and a willingness to continue on. Some things we won't understand because we have to, I guess, go through the school of hard knocks. Uh, that's what Peter had to do. Peter thought he was ready for everything. But what happened to him? Peter was a different person altogether after the events of Calvary and his denying. The Lord knew that, and we'll see what happens later on when the Lord talks to Peter again. But now notice that uh, Jesus talks to Thomas. He too doesn't have a grasp of things as he would later on. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Well, he just wasn't picking up on what the Lord meant. But Jesus gives us this, this wonderful statement. It's one of the grandest statements in the whole Bible. He says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me or unto the Father except by me. And he says, if you'd known me, you would know my Father also. Let me begin with that last part there. Do you want to know the Father? Do you want to understand the one God? Then understand Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. Well, how do I do that? You have the last will and testament. You have his will set out in his words have been given through inspired writers in the New Testament. And if I can know what is said there, I know not only Jesus, I know the Father. And that's important to understand when we look at this. But Jesus is the way. He's not one way among many. Now, one of the things we run into today in our world, it's been around all along. And think of the day that the Lord uttered these words, how the world was religiously. Multiplicity of gods. Well, today there's a multiplicity of religions. There's still pagan religions talking about gods that are in reality no gods. But then we're around a lot of people that call God their Father, Christ their Savior, the Bible, the Word of God, but then they don't follow it. They don't obey the truth. Because remember, he says here, I am the way, the truth. Not one truth among many truths, but I am the truth. Then he says, I am the life. There's not a multiple choice that we have to say, well, which, which thing shall I believe that I can choose how to get there? There are many lives. No, there's not many lives. There's only one life, Jesus Christ. 
When we begin to say that today, we probably will be very surprised at how many people that even will say that Jesus is Son of God or that God exists or the Bible is the Word of God. But when you say, unless you believe in Christ and obey Him, you are lost when you die. You might be surprised how many people who claim to believe in God and Christ in the Bible who just can't bring themselves to believe that. Well, then they've missed the boat when they do. How can you look at what Jesus said and said, this is from the mind of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That couldn't be clear. You just have to say, I don't believe it. You're, in fact, you're, you're going to say, I don't believe it, or I do believe it. Now, the proof of actually believing it is the compliance in your life with what he tells you to do. As he will say also a little later, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. Yeah, but I love him, but I don't think I have to. Then you don't love him. That's what I should do with myself. If I say, well, I love the Lord, but I'm figuring out ways that I don't have to do what I read in the Bible. He says I must do. Then you don't love him. You need to correct the love. You need to get a different understanding of love. Because Jesus loved the Father. He set the example or pattern. And he always did, as he said, what his Father told him to do. So he's left us an example of obedience. Even in the garden, as a human being, oh, he didn't want to go to the cross. He didn't want to undergo that terrible ordeal. But he not only loved the Father to the other most, but that tells you how much he loved us. Because without him doing that, there is no salvation for anybody. Then after he turns from Peter and then Thomas, he turned all the disciples actually at the beginning here, let not your heart be troubled. He then says uh, something to Philip. Philip said, after Thomas had said these words, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. It's enough. Show us the Father. You see how far they'd missed things all the time, though they'd been with him, which as best we can understand over three years, they were with him all day long, but they had missed these things. They were hearing him say all sorts of things, in his teaching, things that's not even recorded here, but they were not getting the message. Now that tells me something about any teaching that goes on. You think sometimes that people are understanding. You think they're getting the message. But I assure you, if these folks didn't get the message from Jesus, the master teacher, but a lot of times people don't get the message as to what must I do to be saved in answer to that question or what is involved in being a Christian. I've spent too long in my personal work as a preacher to know you can preach your heart out. You can teach on the same thing and come at it from as many different ways as you think that you need to to hopefully uh, get people to understand. And you'll find out many times they don't. Now, I'm not saying I know all the reasons they don't, but I know they don't, which means you must continue to teach and to teach and to teach. And you've heard me say this before, and it's not original with me. I don't claim it, uh, but you've probably used it too. What is the best way to teach somebody? Repetition, repetition, repetition. That's the way that we get it over to some people. I really don't know what's going on in people's heads when I'm trying to teach. But I do know they can look at you and give you all the visible signs that they're listening, but I don't know where their mind is. So we need to understand this, if nothing else, from people like Peter and Thomas and Philip. So we look here and see that uh, Jesus actually events a little bit here we that's the way I, that's what i'm going to call it when he responds to philip and says have i been so long with you and yet you have not 
come to know me, Philip? What does it tell you about what the Lord had been doing? All the time these men have been with him. Well, there's a lot of times that I guess any teacher almost takes a deep breath and sighs and says, have I been so long with you teaching and you don't get it yet? Well, that was what was happening here. Notice he then says what we've been saying. He that's seen me, seen the Father. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? Now watch. The words that I say to you, I don't speak these. Well, he's basically saying of my own initiative. But the Father abiding in me is doing this. Again, this gets into the matter of deity, the one God. And great, as Paul said, is the mystery of godliness. I can understand much about it, but I don't understand how you can have three persons, but one divine essence. And that divine essence exists in three persons. But that's exactly what, Peter, what Jesus is saying to them at this time, that he couldn't do anything except that it be from the Father. The Father's in him, he's in the Father, and so on. Well, as we look at this a little further, we see that um, he starts talking about his going away. He starts talking about further the Father's working with them. In verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the Father? This is him again to Philip and the Father in me. But then notice the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Always remember Christ's authority was delegated to him by the Father in whom in here's all authority. So he says, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he also shall he do also, and greater works in thee shall, shall he do, because I go unto my Father. That wouldn't be clear to them at that time, but it would be later, and we'll just say right now, it would be when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, first Pentecost, following the resurrection of Christ in Jerusalem. He says in verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the, in the Son. Now I recognize that um, there is in prayer, when we study prayer, the need to ask by the authority of Christ, whatever we ask of the Father. I understand that. But at this particular time, and that's important in setting the context, he's talking to the apostles and it pertains directly to his leaving them and what their work is as to why he chose them in the first place. So it goes far more than Christians today Praying in the name of Christ. That is what we should do. But notice, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. American Standard, you will keep my commandments. It's interesting that he would say that to these who were the closest to him. But now remember, it won't be long. You might say the words would hardly be out of his mouth before Peter would deny him three times. And they all would be fearful and depart from him. But notice what he tells them when he points to the future. Will they understand it at the time he says this to them? No, but they would later. He says, and, so that's connected with verse 15. It's a conjunction. And I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Let's talk about that just a minute because 
this again is said to the apostles regarding the work he called them to do and the place that they would have when it comes to the church. I will pray the Father. Notice he petitions the Father. He requests of the Father and the Father gives them something. Another comforter. The Greek word is parakletos and there's not any one word in the English language that properly translates that. In our version, it says comforter. But the para, we'll just transliterate it. The paraclete is far more than a comforter. That's an important point. But notice it's another comforter. You can't have another something unless you had one that preceded it. Now, who was the one that preceded it? Well, Jesus is the one that is their comforter now, but he's in the flesh. He's trying to get them ready because he's already said, I'm leaving. And you can't come right now where I'm going. But now remember, I'm going there for a purpose. And I'm coming back. We'll receive you to myself that where you may be also. There you may be also. So this comforter, this parakletos, is going to take the place of Christ, but he won't be in human form. He'll always be with you to do the work I call you to do as the apostles of Christ. Let me pause here and say what I've said many times in sermons regarding Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. The early church, right at this very beginning, understood the place of the apostles of Christ when it came to Christ giving direction to the church because they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the apostles' teaching. Why didn't they say, or why didn't Luke record they continued steadfastly in the doctrine of Christ? Well, in reality, he did. Because of the work of the apostles of Christ and the Holy Spirit invisibly working through them as he had done in the flesh with them. So I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now the forever here means as long as you need him, and that's as long as they live. Sometimes people use forever the same way they use eternal. But you can say something's forever in the sense that it's designated to last a stipulated period of time, so it's forever in the sense that it lasts the time that it was meant to last. And that's true of the law of Moses. So we have to understand that about the use of these terms. Well, notice he emphasizes something because the sentence doesn't stop in verse 16. He emphasizes something about this comforter. Notice that he may abide with you forever then he says, even the spirit of truth. There's the import of the matter. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is going to be the revealer of truth to you. Is going to remind you, he will say later, of everything I ever taught. You won't have to wonder about what you're going to say. It'll be given to you in that self-same hour what you will say. As I've often said, I wish I, I could experience that one time, especially when you're in a debate or something, just to be able to say exactly what ought to be said. And it can't be refuted. God, God said it through you. But that was the apostles. That was their work. Even the spirit of truth in the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you well they could take Christ and they could crucify him but they couldn't do that the Holy Spirit he would continue to supply to them what Christ had supplied to them and I'll say the best way to understand at least I think it is 
the meaning of the parakletos or the paraclete relationship of the Holy Spirit with the apostles is to think about what the Lord was to the apostles on this earth. And in fact, Jesus would continue, if you please, to be with them, but he'd be, be with them through his agent, who's the Holy Spirit. We may have more to say about that later, but right now that's the point we want to make. Notice verse 18 after he says that. I will not leave you comfortless. Now notice what I said a moment ago. I will come to you. Now wait a minute. I will pray the Father and he will send you another comforter. Now he's saying, I will come to you. Is that strange? No, because they're deity. What one does, all do. Did God become a man? Yes. It was Christ. Then God became a man. Part of the divine essence. Without beginning or ending. Great I am. So how is Christ going to come to these apostles? Through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Exactly how he's going to do it. And he's with us today through the truth of God's will. And we're not talking about providential activity. Who all knows what God's doing right now on our behalf? Nobody can tell you that. Nobody, nobody can tell you what angels are doing right now. I don't ever concern myself with those things. I pray to God like he taught me to. And however he answers that prayer is his business. I do take comfort in the fact that when we have the Lord giving the picture of, of the poor old beggar Lazarus dying, representing a saved person, that he says the angels came and escorted him to Abraham's bosom. I don't know why I should say, well, that's the only time that ever happened. Well, I think it's a preview of exactly what happens when a child of the living God leaves this world. Uh, we sometimes, I guess the best thing to say, we don't use all of the comfort the Bible has for us to strengthen us to live from day to day in the matters of life and all that the devil can throw at us. I don't have any qualms at all of saying that when a faithful child of God's spirit leaves his body, being who he is, a child of God. Now, how many children of God, as the Bible defines them, left their thirst today? Well, I'm sure some did, but not in comparison to the many millions that left that were not. And the quicker people would realize that if you're faithful to God, you are very special to him. Now, will that comfort you or will it not? It ought to. So he says, yet a little while the world sees me no more, but ye see me because I live, ye shall also live. At that day ye shall know, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Let me cause here by saying, when we're baptized scripturally, we're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into Christ. We're in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3, Paul said, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. Rather, we have a relationship now with God described as being in Christ with blessings that nobody else has, simply because we're children of living God and faithfully serving him. And thus, as the old song says, we close the lesson. If I live faithful in the death, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Holy and righteous Father, to thee we give glory and praise. I'm thankful that in the midst of this busy week, we can assemble as we have in this technology, study thy word, to meditate on it, reflect upon the wonderful things in store for us in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Help us to study it, to think about it, and to grow and develop in the likeness of Christ. Be with thy people throughout the world that we will rejoice exceedingly in the thoughts of eternity and glory with thee. And so may these things work to help us to be stronger, to purify our lives, and walk closer to thee. For a good night of rest, we pray 
and for strength to live for thee however much longer we have on this earth. We pray for those who haven't obeyed the gospel, that they would do so before it's eternally too late, realizing that time is being given them, even now, to learn the truth and obey it. Strengthen us now, Father, to love each other's brethren. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.